Well, on behalf of the U.S. Philippine Society, welcome you to today's program. Uh, good morning and happy Halloween. Uh, our thanks to the Stimson Center and Southeast Asia Program Director Brian Eiler, who will serve as moderator. Uh, the hard and constant work of diplomacy is too often obscured by the news cycle, a reality that's especially true these days. To be clear, our speakers are not here to make news, rather to preview the next month's high-level meetings in the Philippines that will draw leaders together from across the dynamic Asia-Pacific and Southeast Asia regions. To provide context to those discussions, we have Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Southeast Asia, Patrick Murphy, and the Philippine Embassy Charge d'Affaires, Patrick Chua Soto, along with distinguished panelists, Professor Bill Wise of Johns Hopkins Sice, and Meredith Miller, Vice President at the Albright Stonebridge Group. We look forward to Das Murphy's insights into the U.S. government's goals for the summits and CDA Chua Soto's presentation on the role of the Philippine government as host of the 2017 ASEAN, ASEAN Plus, and East Asia summits. We have asked Professor Wise to provide a strategic perspective uh, and Ms. Miller to discuss the economic trade and investment stakes. Both have deep experience in government and in the private sector. Uh, bios for all the participants uh, are in your program. Mr. Richard Blackwood, uh, who handles Philippine Affairs at the State Department, has also agreed to join us this morning, so welcome, Richard. Uh, and welcome to uh, special friends. We have directors of the U.S. Philippine Society people that we're getting to know from Stimson, uh, Rick Jacobson, who traveled probably farthest. I think we give you the award for, for the most miles uh, earned on this one. Um, a special recognition to U.S. Philippine Society President Ambassador John Maisto, uh, who will deliver closing remarks. You may submit your questions in writing uh, on the note cards provided. So let's begin by welcoming uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Patrick Murphy. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to take a few minutes to talk about something other than Washington politics, <laughs> uh, the Asia Pacific, about which we can be very passionate. Lots going on there, lots in the US interests uh, with global uh, implications. I really want to say thank you very much to the US Philippine Society doing terrific work these last few work, uh, years on an important relationship and alliance. Um, and a great friendship between our two peoples. So thank you very much, uh, Hank, for your great work. Uh, also, Brian, thank you very much for hosting here at the Stimson Center. I want to particularly highlight the great work that you do on resource issues in the Southeast Asia region. Uh, the Mekong in, in particular, we've had great partnerships with Stimson over the years and delighted with all the good work that you do. Uh, Patrick Chiusoto is a fantastic colleague and has been shepherding uh, the relationship on behalf of the Philippines for over, well over a year now, um, earning his pay, covering down at least a job and a half. Um, thank you very much, Patrick, for all that you do, and it's a del delight to share uh, this opportunity with you today. I think it's a great time to talk about the relationship with Asia, and most specifically with Southeast Asia, and that's what I'm going to focus on today, Philippines in particular. We're quite busy gearing up for the President's first trip to uh, Asia, and it's a very ambitious one. Uh, he departs uh, this Friday and will travel to five countries over nine days, Japan, Republic of Korea, China, Vietnam, and the Philippines. In fact, this is the longest trip of a U.S. President to the region since 1991. It's 27 years, so it's a very extensive trip and it reflects this administration's commitment to the Indo-Pacific region. I think that's been on display since the very beginning with uh, a great deal of engagement that's been going on with Asia uh, throughout this calendar year. The President views the trip as an excellent opportunity to reaffirm our commitment to our allies, express support for a rules-based order, and reiterate our desire to work with partners to advance mutual economic and security issues across the Indo-Pacific. 
In Manila, and I want to focus on that because that comes at the end of the trip, but it's really the heart of the matter in terms of our regional architecture and with whom the president will engage. There he will reaffirm the enduring U.S. commitment to ASEAN-centered regional architecture as he engages with counterparts from the 18 countries that comprise the East Asia Summit. This is the region's premier leaders-led forum for addressing the Indo-Pacific's most pressing issues. The president will also give attention to our enduring bilateral alliance with the Philippines. I'll have a little bit more on that to say in a few minutes. In Manila, the president will help celebrate the 50th anniversary this year of ASEAN. And he will co-chair the US ASEAN 40th anniversary commemorative summit with President Duterte of the Philippines. At that summit, Prime Minister Najiba Malaysia will also have a key role as Malaysia is our current country coordinator uh, with the United States on behalf of ASEAN. Uh, the President uh, will be in Manila through November 13th, and before departing, he will participate in several East Asia summit activities, including a gala dinner, the opening ceremony, and other engagements with his 17 counterparts from across the region. In this 50th anniversary year, we celebrate ASEAN and all that it has achieved. Since its establishment, ASEAN has been very successful, particularly in avoiding any major interstate conflict. It has lifted tens of millions out of poverty and promoted efforts to increase partnerships across borders. It's a very ambitious enterprise when it first came about in the late 1960s and has achieved a great deal. And we're very proud to be partners with ASEAN for these past 40 years. The President's priority goals for his meetings in Manila are to support continued peace and prosperity in Southeast Asia and across the entire Indo-Pacific region as we seek a denuclearized Korean Peninsula, respect for international law, particularly in the South China Sea, and continued partnerships in the fight against terrorism. Now, let me just offer a couple of words on each of these top priorities. There are other issues that will be discussed, of course, but these three figure quite prominently. The very top of the list is North Korea. I don't think it's any surprise to all of you as observers of the region. The DPRK's nuclear and ballistic missile programs pose an immediate and growing threat to the region and to the globe. We commend ASEAN at the core of this architecture for its very strong statements, in particular very recently in August 5th and September 7th, in which ASEAN members expressed grave concern about the DPRK's provocative actions. The President, while he's in Manila, and indeed across the rest of the region, will seek to deepen support for our policy of maximum economic and diplomatic pressure. It really is all about giving diplomacy a chance to, to achieve objectives. He will call on ASEAN countries to reverse the flow of North Korean guest workers and impose bans on North Korean coal imports. Across the region, we've seen a lot of action, uh, particularly this year in response to the growing threats. And the President will be in a position, position to continue to ask for further support for these objectives. He will also ask ASEAN to consider whether North Korea's behavior is in line with ASEAN's principles of stability, peace, security, and prosperity. Therefore, there is a good question on the table whether the DPRK merits continued inclusion in international bodies devoted to these principles, such as the ASEAN Regional Forum. On the South China Sea, we want to recognize ASEAN's good work especially this year under the leadership of the Philippines as the current chair of ASEAN and Singapore, which is the country coordinator on behalf of ASEAN with China, as this collective body has advanced dialogue with China on the South China Sea set of issues. We support meaningful code of conduct negotiations, and we hope very much that they will yield a framework that is legally binding effective and consistent with international law. 
I really want to underscore that dialogue is essential to this process, and we are very pleased to see that it's underway and that it is inclusive. But it's also very important for the region, not just the claimant countries, but ASEAN and the greater region to speak out publicly and privately against militarization of outposts, land reclamation, further construction on those outposts in the South China Sea, so that dialogue can succeed. It's very difficult to discuss a binding code of conduct if there are provocative actions that continue in the background. On counterterrorism, we remain deeply concerned about growing threats of terrorism, particularly related to ISIS affiliates, including in Southeast Asia. We view it as a priority to work with ASEAN to stem terrorist recruitment, spread of ideology, and do everything that we can to reduce the potential for violence. We are very committed to partnering with ASEAN to strengthen multilateral mechanisms to enhance aviation and border security, share additional information, and counter terrorist financing. It seems quite appropriate that the meetings this year will convene in the Philippines, which is having a challenge of its own. Our longstanding friend and ally has experienced firsthand the tragic effects of this growing terrorist threat. The Philippines, of course, is not alone in the region, but the challenges in the south, in Mindanao, have been quite dramatic for the better part of half of this year. The October 23rd liberation of Marawi, however, ended a five-month battle with ISIS-affiliated groups, leaving hundreds dead and displacing over 360,000 people. It's been very significant, and I think even more significant than much of the international community appreciates. We commend the armed forces of the Philippines for bravery and sacrifice, including the loss of some of its members. And we're very proud of the unique US-Philippine security partnership and alliance, which helped assist in achieving this victory. The United States worked very closely throughout the crisis with the armed forces of the Philippines to increase ISR, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance capabilities. In the last year alone, the United States provided over $40 million in security assistance, trained thousands of Philippine troops, and held frequent joint exercises on counterterrorism operations. The liberation of Marawi, from our perspective, and I, I think we will hear from the Charge from the Philippines' perspective as well, is just the beginning. A commitment to stabilization efforts is crucial to maintaining military gains and fighting ISIS ideology. Therefore, the United States has committed over $14 million to address the needs of internally displaced persons, help restore public services, revitalize the economy in that region, promote community reconciliation and alternatives to violent extremism. We believe the alliance has been very much on display this year in cooperating with the Philippines to tackle this pressing problem. Let me just say a quick word about US-Philippines relations. We think it's important as we discuss challenges to reflect on deep, enduring bilateral ties which make this partnership possible. The Filipino people are some of our closest friends and allies anywhere in the world. Our relationship is built on shared sacrifices for democracy, respect for human rights, strong people-to-people, -people, and societal ties. The partnership with the Philippines is very broad, and this alliance is, alliance is one of our most enduring partnerships and relationships anywhere in the Indo-Pacific region. It's been a cornerstone of stability for over 70 years. As I say, there have been many shared sacrifices. You only have to reflect on the World War II experience, but many examples since uh, demonstrate uh, this is a, an alliance of mutual commitment and admiration. Our overall military-to-military -military relationship with the Philippines remains robust and multifaceted. As I said, the efforts in Marawi have been on display this year, but there are many other examples as well. At the request of the Philippine government, as just one example, the US military helped mobilize a response in 2013 to the deadly typhoon that some call Haiyan, some call Yolanda, 
but it had an enormous impact on the Philippines and the friendship, the ties between our countries were on display with that response. And it was instrumental in meeting the needs of thousands of Filipinos. There are roughly four million US citizens in our country of Filipino ancestry. Over 220,000 US citizens call the Philippines home, including many veterans of our armed services. There are over 650,000 American citizens who visit the Philippines each year. The ties are strong, the bonds are enduring. As in every friendship, partnership, or even alliances, there are challenges, there are differences. However, through mutual engagement, we believe we have guided the relationship to very solid ground. I want to point out the terrific role of our own envoy uh, in Manila, Ambassador Sung Kim, and his dedicated team at Embassy Manila. They have been fantastic in building these ties and putting the relationship on solid footing. One of those areas, one of those challenges, we have been very honest uh, with our friends in the Philippines uh, with regards to the effort to counter narcotics. The reality is we have a lot of shared problems. Our own country is facing a major uh, narcotics uh, resurgence and impact on our communities. Same in the Philippines. And we want to work together and we have many areas of collaboration. For example, stemming the international flow of narcotics and precursor chemicals in uh, working on rehabilitation and many other areas. We very much hope, of course, that the Philippines can continue its efforts with full respect of human rights and under the rubric of the rule of law. President's visit to Manila, Manila, like his trip to Asia, will be his first to the Philippines as president. It's an opportunity to reaffirm our ironclad commitment to the alliance. And he will be sharing that with Filipino leadership and the Filipino people. So the president's first visit to Asia, I think, is quite highly anticipated. If you remember back in April, Vice President Pence made that very early announcement and commitment that the president would be traveling to Southeast Asia. And of course, as I mentioned at the outset, the trip has become an epic journey across five countries. Um, and indeed, I will point out, he will have not just five stops, but six stops uh, in Vietnam. He will both be in, in Da Nang and in Hanoi. He looks forward to the vital engagements with many friends, partners, including ASEAN, and most especially our friends in the Philippines. The United States will continue to maintain a very strong president, presence in the Indo-Pacific region. We'll continue to pursue policies that contribute to the peace, stability, and prosperity, both in the region and back home here in the United States. It's going to be a great visit. Uh, I will be a small part of it for one of those stops uh, and very much looking forward to engaging with my counterparts supporting the president with our membership and our commitment to the multilateral architecture that defines a great deal of our engagement with the Indo-Pacific region. Thank you very much, Brian. Well, I'll have a chance to ask a few questions to Deputy Assistant Secretary Patrick Murphy uh, after uh, Patrick Chuasado gives his keynote address. Good morning to all of you. Uh, at the outset, allow me to thank uh, the U.S. Philippine Society and the Stevenson Center for hosting this uh, event uh, to preview the uh, Philippine hosting of the ASEAN summits. And uh, to my namesake, uh, Das Murphy, you know, a good colleague to work with. It's been a pleasure working with the U.S. government through the interlocutor of the State Department. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to participate in this symposium, which is uh, well-timed as it directly precedes the 31st ASEAN Summit and related meeting. And thank you, uh, Das Murphy, for jump-starting our discussions and giving us an informative overview 
of the U.S.'s perspectives and priorities on the U.S.-ASEAN relationship as we head into the summit meetings in a few days. I hope to be able to give all of you an equally instructive idea of how the Philippines chairmanship has taken place over the past year, and through this, we can also all have a sense of the prospects and challenges facing the region presently and in the years to come. As you are all aware, the Philippines assumed officially its chairmanship of ASEAN on January 1, 2017. It was quite an opportunity as well as that our chairmanship coincided with ASEAN's 50th anniversary and 40th anniversary of ASEAN-US relations. The work plan was extensive, consisting of two leader-level summits, 19 ministerial meetings, 41 senior officials meetings, and more than 80 working group meetings, not to mention the various commemorative activities for the ASEAN's 50th year. Throughout 2017, the Philippines' as chair advances an ASEAN that is partnering for trade in the world. Priorities, and these have been spoken and elaborated on quite a bit this past year. Allow me to enumerate them again for memory's sake. These are one, a people oriented and people centered ASEAN, two, peace and stability in the region, three, maritime security and cooperation, four, inclusive innovation led growth, fifth, ASEAN's resiliency, and sixth, ASEAN as a model of regionalism in a global player. Under these six thematic priorities, we are seeking positive change in the lives of our peoples that leverage on ASEAN's active involvement and engagement with existing and potential external partners. The eventual outcomes of our chairmanship will be measured against these thematic priorities. By many respects, the substance of these priorities will carry forward in the coming years we also submit that among the ways forward for ASEAN's longevity are embedded in the six thematic priorities of the Philippines' ASEAN chairmanship. First, ASEAN must put the welfare of its citizens at the center of its work program and build a regional community that protects their rights and promotes their well-being. An inclusive ASEAN community must invest in the region's human capital by advancing universal access to education and health. Our citizens must themselves have a sense that ASEAN matters and is relevant in their lives. Second, we must continue to uphold peaceful coexistence and enhance partnerships among ASEAN member states. Peaceful settlement of disputes as a basic principle will continue to stand ASEAN in good stead and reinforce its convening power. Third, ASEAN must continue to demonstrate its adherence to the rule of law and the peaceful resolution of disputes as well as the preservation and protection of maritime resources. The ASEAN way is a tried and tested approach to dealing with difficult subjects such as the South China Sea. It has taken some time, but we are beginning to break ground on ASEAN's negotiations with China on a code of conduct in the South China Sea next year. Confidence building measures have been agreed upon by both sides, including MFA to MFA hotlines, and a code on unplanned encounters at sea. Fourth, ASEAN's inclusive economic growth must be sustained in the medium to long term, principally through developing MSMEs to spur entrepreneurship in an innovation-driven economy. Progress also rests on the back of a stable, interconnected, and integrated regional infrastructure. Fifth, ASEAN must enhance its resiliency and ability to respond effectively in the face of natural disasters. This necessarily involves strengthening the capacities of the ASEAN Coordinating Center for Humanitarian Assistance and the ASEAN Center for Biodiversity. And sixth, it will do ASEAN well to strengthen its institutions and to build its credentials as a global player while maintaining ASEAN centrality and solidarity in institutional platforms involving its external partners. Indeed, Intra-ASEAN dialogue and its external partnerships over five decades have spawned a wide web of institutional arrangements supporting ASEAN community building. As we all know, ASEAN remains at the core and center of ASEAN Plus 3, the East Asia Summit, 10 dialogue partnerships, and the ASEAN Regional Forum. Ladies and gentlemen, 
As of last week, the Philippines had already completed a total of 129 out of 142 meetings that we had programmed to host and chair in 2017. We count among these one summit, 17 ministerial meetings, 39 senior officials meetings, and 72 working group meetings. The list of accomplished deliverables thus far is quite extensive, but allow me some time to just go over some of the highlights. The 30th ASEAN Summit last April resulted in several notable outcomes, which included the signing of an ASEAN Declaration on the Role of Civil Service as a Catalyst for Achieving ASEAN Community Vision 2025, the adoption of the BIMP IAGA Vision 2025, a successor document to both the BIMP IAGA Roadmap 20, 2005 to 2010 and the BIMP IAGA Implementation Blueprint 2012 to 2016, and the launching of the Davao General Santos Bitung ASEAN Roll On, Roll Off Sea Linkage Route. It was also during this summit that ASEAN reiterated its call for its external partners to recognize the importance of ASEAN centrality in its engagements with the region and to honor the valued principle of non interference in the internal affairs of member states. The 50th ASEAN Foreign Ministers meeting and the related meetings followed in August, and it was during this time that the region was also able to engage with its external partners, particularly through the ASEAN post-ministerial conferences with its dialogue partners, the 18th ASEAN plus three foreign ministers meeting, the 7th East Asia Summit foreign, foreign ministers meeting, and the 24th ASEAN Regional Forum. In their meeting, ASEAN foreign ministers issued statements on the developments in the Korean Peninsula, the situation in the Al Haram Al Sharif compound, and one on the 50th anniversary of ASEAN. Several other targeted outcomes were also achieved with ASEAN's external partners, which included the adoption of the framework of the Code of Conduct in the South China Sea, the signing of the revised MOU and establishment of ASEAN China Center, the adoption of an ASEAN EU statement on Paris Agreement on reaffirming commitment to cooperation to address the shared challenge of climate change, the adoption of the revised implementation plan of the ASEAN-Japan Vision Statement, a statement with Russia on joint efforts to combat international terrorism, the issuance of an ARF statement on enhancing cooperation in addressing and countering the drug problem, and the issuance of an ARF statement on cooperation to prevent, deter, and eliminate illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, which was incidentally also co-sponsored by the U.S. As we head into November, Preparations are pretty much clear and nearing their end point. Focus on the delivery of a number of key outcome documents. Various sectoral bodies have and continue to put in a lot of work with the interest of forging consensus in such areas as radicalization and violent extremism, cybercrime, trafficking in person, women's economic empowerment, innovation, trade facilitation, e-commerce, the rights of migrant workers, health, climate change, youth development, just to name a few. Some of the major deliverables the Philippines aims to realize include an ASEAN consensus on the protection and promotion of the rights of migrant workers, an ASEAN declaration on a culture of prevention for peaceful, inclusive, resilient, <coughs> healthy, and harmonious society, and an ASEAN-China leaders declaration for, de for a decade of coastal and marine environmental protection in the South China Sea. <coughs> Naturally, there are also several documents to be delivered with ASEAN's external partners. At the level of the ASEAN Plus 3, we are preparing a statement on food security. At the East Asia Summit, we look forward to the adoption of a leader's declaration on anti-money laundering, encountering the financing of terrorism, and various statements on cooperation in poverty alleviation, chemical weapons, and preventing the countering and spread of terrorist ideology. In the United Nations, we expect to see a report on complementarities between ASEAN Community Vision 2025 and the UN's 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. There's also a high possibility of a joint leader statement on the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Ladies and gentlemen, of course, this year is especially significant as we likewise celebrate the 40th anniversary of ASEAN's partnership with the United States. And there are several milestones we can anticipate come next month. ASEAN's relationship with the U.S. stands out because of the strength of our mutual confidence and trust. 
Our strategic partnership with the U.S. has contributed to the region's many unprecedented successes and has led to an immeasurable deepening of exchanges at the people-to-people -people levels. Just this month, I attended an event hosted by the State Department's Wysili Exchange Visitor Program at Capitol Hill intended to celebrate the 40th anniversary of U.S.-ASEAN relations and the 50th anniversary of ASEAN. <coughs> No less than 150 YCLE visiting fellows from all over ASEAN were there that day, including 30 or so delegates from the Philippines. The opportunity to have personally engaged with this batch of YCLE fellows before they were begin their professional exchange programs in various U.S. states and institutions was nothing short of inspiring. They were brilliant, vibrant, and joyous group and who showed much promise and determination. Despite coming from diverse backgrounds, their collective aspiration for making friends and building relationships was strikingly palpable. Waisili is just an outstanding example of how today's millennials will drive ASEAN-US relations in the future and develop ASEAN's next generation of leaders. The bridges these young individuals build will surely help the bonds that connect us today and tomorrow. As you are all well aware of, President Trump will also be arriving in Manila on the 12th for the special gala celebration for ASEAN's 50th anniversary and will also attend the ASEAN summit and as that's Murphy mentioned other meetings. We look forward to President Donald Trump's attendance and participation in as much as this exemplifies the United States' renewed commitment to the strategic partnership with ASEAN, which forges a common path towards a peaceful, stable, and prosperous Asia-Pacific region. A number of key outcome documents are programmed for the ASEAN-US 40th Anniversary Commemorative Summit itself. The Chairman's statement of the 5th ASEAN-US Summit will review cooperation thus far and its direct future direction, along with encapsulating the exchange of views on topical regional and international issues. Meanwhile, there will also be a statement commemorating the 40th Anniversary of US-ASEAN relations. This statement aims to reaffirm key areas of the US, ASEAN US strategic partnership. Two other outputs are being contemplated an ASEAN US leader statement on cyber and digital economy issues, and a document on ASEAN US cooperation in fostering trade in telecommunications and information technology services. Indeed, these areas for further strengthened cooperation will be pivotal in pushing forward the common interests of ASEAN and the US in the sense that they are also focused on enabling an increasingly already robust trade in investments between the two sides. ASEAN remains a major destination of global foreign direct investment, receiving around 16% of global FDI among developing economies. Regional investment expansion by multinational enterprises has remained strong as foreign MNEs continue to expand their footprint in the region's manufacturing finance and services industries and infrastructure development. There's good reason this will remain a constant for several years to come, serving as well as an important linchpin in a fuel for the future of ASEAN-US relations. ASEAN's robust market, best practices in investments and high returns on investment are why foreign businesses continue to benefit from their extensive relationships in the region. Today, over 1,600 U.S. companies and some 70% of the top 130 U.S. companies listed in the 2015 edition of the global Fortune 500 operate in ASEAN. The stock of foreign direct investments in ASEAN from the U.S. reached almost $274 billion by the end of 2015, representing over a third of U.S. investments in Asia. ASEAN also re makes real business sense as a profitable market for U.S. companies. ASEAN member states taken together rank fourth after Canada, Mexico, and China as a good exports market for the United States. The U.S. exported $75 billion in goods and $27 billion in services to ASEAN in 2015. Specifically, ASEAN is the sixth largest importer of U.S. agricultural goods worth a little more than $10 billion. All 50 states export to ASEAN. Those goods and services exports support almost 550,000 American jobs directly or indirectly. It also notes, uh, it's in, also interesting to note that majority of U.S. FDI in ASEAN, about 72%, is in the services sector. The logic behind enhanced cooperation in the digital economy and trade 
in information technology services thus stands for good reason, particularly as ASEAN aims to expand opportunities for SMEs to play a stronger, integral role in global, global value chains. ASEAN's digital economy is projected to grow by 500% and be worth $50 billion by 2025. It's also interesting to note that visitors from ASEAN add $5 billion to the U.S. economy in a year. There are indeed many good op economic opportunities that can be availed for mutual benefit. Before I close, I'd like to say a few words on uh, Philippine-U.S. relations. Uh, we appreciate you know, the assistance of, uh, of the U.S. Uh, in, in the operations and in Marawi, as uh, Das Murphy had mentioned, and through their uh, energetic ambassador uh, in Manila, Ambassador Sung Kim, you know, we've uh, had uh, you know, good, good relations uh, in the U.S. and on all fronts. And, um, you know, as uh, Das Murphy had mentioned, you know, uh, as uh, treaty allies and good friends, we have often uh, had you know, uh, good dialogues and exchanges on many issues of mutual interest uh, and concern. And uh, you know, uh, one of those uh, issues uh, concerns uh, counter narcotics. And uh, you know, we hope that there will be a good discussion uh, on, on cooperation in that field. And just want to point out that uh, you know. The Philippines, as a uh, you know, uh, country that addresses uh, the, the scourge, just like the United States, you know, um, employs its uh, methods as, uh, as it deems fit to address a concern that is uh, quite, uh, you know, quite prevalent in the main uh, mandate given by the people of the Philippines to President Duterte. With that, um, I thank you for this opportunity to socialize uh, ASEAN in the strategic partnership with the U.S. with this distinguished audience and uh, look forward to further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Sharjay Chuasado. Um, and I want to commend you and your team in the Philippines mm -hmm. on a successful and productive year as ASEAN chair. Uh, those who follow ASEAN know that it's uh, the responsibilities uh, and the tasks involved with being ASEAN chair. You have to you know, climb a mountain and run a marathon for the whole year. So I, I, I know you're all waiting in anticipation to exhale and hand the keys over to Singapore. Um, but much good work left to do the remaining, for the remainder of this year. We're going to move into a very brief uh, Q&A session for Das Murphy. Um, he needs to return to C Street uh, and continue with preparations for the upcoming trip. But we do have the privilege of being able to interact with him. And this will be done with microphones. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. The cards will be used for our Q&A uh, during the panel discussion uh, at the end of the event. Our staff will respond with microphones. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Ava Avila. Uh, so you gave an overview of the strategic priorities of um, the U.S. to Asia. But then um, Trunk is uh, uh, flying there for thousands of miles but leaving the eve of the East Asian Summit. What is, that, what is the impact of that um, act towards the relationship of, of the U.S. to Asia or, or your role as the global leader, or you don't you don't want to be the leader anymore. So let, let me describe from our perspective how we approach uh, Manila. There are a number of key events and activities over the over the course of of three days at the leader level. Uh, of course, ASEAN has uh, a, a longer uh, list of engagements, but for the United States, it fundamentally boils down to the U.S. ASEAN summit. And that will include the, the president with his 10 counterparts from the ASEAN member states, plus the secretary general of uh, ASEAN. And the president will co-chair that summit with Prime Minister Najib, uh, with, Prime Minister, with President Duterte, sorry, and uh, a special role for Prime Minister Najib, as I said. The East Asia summit is comprised of a series of activities. 
and the President will be there for the opening gala dinner to celebrate ASEAN's 50th anniversary, the opening session of the East Asia Summit, and a number of other activities through which he engages his 17 counterparts. Now, due to some scheduling uh, challenges for the White House, as I mentioned, this is a very long trip. He needs to depart Manila on November 13th. He will have participated in a great deal of East Asia Summit activities uh, at that point. For the meeting, the final meeting that takes place on November 14th, the United States will be represented at a suitably senior level um, and stand by for a forthcoming announcement uh, on that. Uh, aside from the bilateral military assistance to the Philippines, will the visit of President uh, Trump bring with him a written commitment in bolstering and enhancing the maritime development and security of the, of the Philippines? Yeah, thank you for the question. You know, as I noted, the alliance with the Philippines is very multidimensional, very broad. I focused on some of our security assistance because of the particular pressing challenge this year. But we have a long-standing, uh, for example, development program, presence of USAID, many, many, many activities working in health and education and the environment. Under the Maritime Security Initiative, the Philippines is a uh, primary recipient. And there is a great deal of activity that goes into improving security in the maritime realm. Our people, the people ties are not only strong um, and, and multidimensional, contributed to by, by civil society, academia, but in terms of a government to government perspective, uh, the Charge kindly pointed out our Young Southeast Asian Leadership Initiative, which this administration has sustained, and it's very, very successful. Hundreds of thousands of youth across the region have, have joined this uh, initiative and participate, um, uh, not only uh, uh, virtually through uh, internet connections and, and virtual gatherings, but uh, in person. And as the Charge said, we recently hosted several hundred here in Washington to com help commemorate the 40th anniversary. Uh, there's a great deal more. We have uh, longstanding Fulbright programs uh, where scholars and students go in both directions between the Philippines uh, and the United States and other agencies contributing to law enforcement cooperation, counterterrorism cooperation across, across the region. You know, one thing that's sometimes not fully appreciated, I believe it's accurate, uh, Patrick will correct me, but the United States is the Philippines' only uh, treaty ally. Uh, and we take that very ser seriously. So the President's fundamental message will be not just continued cooperation in all of these areas, but this ironclad commitment to the alliance itself. Das Murphy, I know that you you need to move on. Um, we don't I see to... a couple of hands. So All let's, right, let's, let's take a couple of more before Excellent. I jump back. Thank you. Um, in the back. I may regret this, but uh, <laughs> let's see what the questions are, right? Good morning. Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, my name is Francesca Argolato. I'm a reporter with Japan Sumeri Shinbun. Uh, Secretary Tillerson told the Senate Foreign Relations Committee um, last night that he still considers North, North Korea the greatest threat to um, U.S. national security. Um, but military officials in the Pacific told reporters uh, traveling with General Dunford that they're less concerned about North Korea than they are about China's military exercises, particularly around Guam. Will that be addressed um, during the president's trip to Asia? Well, North Korea will be a, a significant focus of the president uh, with all of his stops, all, all six of the stops. And North Korea will figure in the conversations, the dialogues, informally and, and formally. It is a tremendous threat. We've seen the pursuit of the ballistic missiles and, and nuclear programs and the, uh, the convergence of these technologies on the horizon. Um, and we believe, however, uh, that diplomacy can succeed, thus the, uh, the maximum pressure campaign. Um, and, and we believe we may be starting to see some uh, results of that. ASEAN's been quite good, and, and ASEAN uh, fully understands the problem. They've seen the threats uh, growing this year. I'm not going to speak for all of the countries, but they have taken actions in reducing diplomatic contact and economic ties in accordance with National Security Council resolutions, two resolutions. 
that have been unanimous, the most recent uh, uh, resolutions, 15 to 0. And ASEAN is looking at exploring and taking other steps to ensure that diplomacy uh, succeeds. Uh, one of the biggest, uh, uh, maybe you can call it a wake-up call, but it was certainly a, a stunning uh, development this year was the assassination of Kim, Kim Jong-nam in a public place in the Kuala Lumpur airport. Um, thus, through other mechanisms, we will be addressing the North Korean uh, threat at these summits. Uh, Patrick highlighted that chemical weapons uh, will be a focus of the East Asia Summit. This year is the 20th anniversary of the Convention on Chemical Weapons, so it's an opportunity to commemorate international cooperation, but point out where chemical weapons have been used in, a, in at least two countries around the world uh, over the past year, and, and Malaysia being one of them. Thank you. Um, I'm Priscilla Clapp, senior advisor at USIP and retired State Department official. Um, Patrick, will the president be having bilaterals with any or all of the Asian leaders at the ASEAN summit uh, besides the president of the Philippines? Uh, thank you, Pr uh, Priscilla. Uh, and I'm glad you pointed out the, uh, the natural bilateral with President Duterte, which will be conducted. Uh, I'll leave to the White House to, to make announcements on this, but the President does plan to have some bilaterals uh, with, uh, with several counterparts. Uh, but hearing you ask the question uh, reminds me, I mentioned the top three priorities from a security perspective for the President's travels, in particular going to Manila, North Korea, South China Sea, and counterterrorism. There are other issues. We've, uh, we've addressed chemical weapons. But there's also the, the challenges of the digital economy and cyber threats uh, that will be discussed. Um, also, the, uh, the greatest humanitarian crisis the region has seen in many, many decades, indeed even the world has seen, uh, and that's the troubling humanitarian uh, catastrophe in Rakhine State, the impact that it's had on Bangladesh, uh, and the need for the, the region to be engaged. And, and the President has uh, discussed this challenge uh, with several of his counterparts already. Uh, good chance for me to remind that the President has hosted four leaders from Southeast Asia this year for visits to the White House. Uh, Vietnam, Malaysia, Thailand, and Singapore. And since this crisis in Rakhine State in Burma erupted on August 25th, the, the President has had three of those visitors and has discussed the situation with, with all three. Um, and we anticipate that this will be a topic of discussion while he's in, in the region. Das Murphy, we want to thank you for your time uh, and candor in, in, in answering questions and in, um, giving us a, a very comprehensive preview of what is to come over the next few weeks. Um, and wish you best on your journey uh, to your one stop. Can we ask which stop you'll be? I'll be going to Manila. Um, I wear a couple of hats as Deputy Assistant Secretary, uh, both responsible for our bilateral relationships, but also our, our multilateral affairs. And Manila is where it all converges, the alphabet soup of, uh, of these institutions. Okay, thank you for coming in. Yep. We're going to do a quick uh, stage change so we can begin our panel. But again, uh, please, a uh, round of applause for our keynote speakers. Thank you all. Thank you. This will be discussion focused, but before we get to the discussion, uh, we will uh, invite our, our distinguished guests, uh, Dr. Bill Wise from SICE and Meredith Miller, Vice President for Southeast Asia at Albright Stonebridge to give brief presentations or previewing uh, President Trump's visit to the Asia Pacific uh, as well as discussion of U.S.-Philippines relations. And, and also joining us um, in, instead of uh, Das Murphy, is uh, Mr. Richard Blackwell from the State Department. He is the Philippines desk officer. Uh, so if we have further questions for, um, for Richard, uh, please continue to ask them. And, and as you are listening, uh, feel free to prepare questions on cards that are distributed. Uh, when you're ready, hold them up. Our staff will come around and collect them. And those will be used during our Q&A discussion at the end of this event. Bill, would you like to kick things off? Thank you, and, and thank you very much for hosting this. Uh, it's uh, obviously very timely, and uh, for those of us who follow Southeast Asian affairs, very important uh, event. 
preceding a very important presidential visit and an ASEAN summit. I should point out at the outset that US presidential visits and ASEAN summits are processes. They are not actually singular events. US presidential visits are prepared through a series of cabinet level uh, visits to the, the country uh, in question, in this case, the Philippines. Secretary Tillerson was there in August. Secretary Mattis was just there in, earlier in October. And there have been uh, successive staff level visits to also prepare the ground. So deliverables are coordinated, uh, statements are agreed upon, and photos are actually planned in advance. It's a set piece. At least it's designed to be a set piece. The same is true of, of, like, uh, of ASEAN summits. They're preceded by almost a year-long series of events building through ministerial meetings, such as the ones that Secretaries Tillerson and Mattis uh, attended uh, uh, earlier, uh, building through these ministerial meetings to uh, reach a, a set of agreed upon activities that will occur at the summit. But these are human events. And these are leader events, and the leaders are politicians. So we do know that the best laid plans of US presidential travelers and ASEAN summiteers are always subject to activities of the moment that were not indeed planned. And I want to look at a couple of issues facing both the US presidential visit and the ASEAN summit, but primarily uh, the relationship between President Trump and President Duterte, uh, look at some uh, questions regarding these, uh, uh, these people and their events and, and ask what might happen that wasn't actually scripted. So starting with President Trump, I have uh, five issues that I'm thinking about and that I'll, questions I'll be looking for answers to regarding his performance in Manila. First, uh, and uh, relating to the notion that most academics have that there is a domestic basis for almost all foreign policy activities, to what extent, if at all, will President, will uh, Special Prosecutor Bobby Mueller's investigation of Russian meddling in the 2016 US presidential election distract President Trump from his mission in Asia? The President's popularity among Americans was at an all-time low before today's announcement of the indictment of, or yesterday's announcement of the indictment of Manafort and Gates and the guilty plea by Papadopoulos. Um, by the time the president arrives in Manila, this story could have, may have died down. But uh, public opinion polling will probably show a further decline in his popularity. How will he uh, handle this? We know he has a great concern on this subject. Uh, moreover, Special Prosecutor Mueller may have additional surprises in store for us. And they could indeed occur while the president is abroad. So I, I wonder, will domestic political concerns consume uh, the president, or will he be able to set these investigations aside and focus exclusively on, on foreign policy opportunities uh, that are presented by this trip? My second issue that I'll be looking at is how will President Trump's performance in Manila influence uh, the Southeast Asian leader's perception of the future of American presence and American goals in the Asia Pacific region? Will President Trump outline a policy and a strategy that reflects greater US interest in the Asia Pacific region? If he does this, will he also uh, describe resources that the US is willing to allocate in the implementation of a Trump Asia policy. Third, specifically with regard to the Philippines, what will be the nature of the personal chemistry between President Trump and President Duterte? They have, as many uh, observers have pointed out, many personal characteristics in common. But are these the sort of qualities that will create a bond between the two leaders? Or will they, these personality uh, issues cause them to separate a little bit, to be more competitive? Fourth, 
Will President Trump have new defense and counterterrorism initiatives to offer to the Philippines? The US has three security priorities in the Philippines, counterterrorism, maritime security, and contingency issues such as uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, among, among others. Will the US offer to uh, help the Philippines rebuild Philippine Special Operations Forces that were decimated in the Morali operation. 1,600 wounded, 160 killed. This was a, 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 an extremely difficult five-month ordeal for the armed forces of the Philippines. So will the U.S. provide additional military equipment for the uh, armed forces of the Philippines maritime security missions or humanitarian assistance and disaster relief uh, activities? The U.S. has already offered significant, uh, as Patrick Murphy pointed out, significant post-conflict stabilization and reconstruction aid. So that is, that is a given, that helping the, Moral, the, the citizens of Morali is uh, an important aspect. I'm asking what beyond that will President Trump have to offer to President Duterte. And finally, I will be looking at how President Trump handles U.S. concerns with the Philippine government's human rights abuses, including extrajudicial killings that are associated with President Duterte's anti-drug campaign. The anti-drug campaign remains wildly popular uh, with the Philippine people, even though uh, recent public opinion polls show an increasing disapproval of the uh, extrajudicial killings as a tactic in the anti-drug campaign. So I think that's an important area to, wa to watch from, from the US. From the Philippine point of view, or looking at President Duterte, I also have five, because symmetry is so important, uh, five questions that I'll be asking. The first is the same as the third question I asked about uh, President Trump. How will the personal chemistry between these two leaders actually work out? What will we see? Second, how will President Duterte characterize the Philippine-US alliance? Will he use President Trump's visit to reinvigorate this alliance? Or will he use the ASEAN meeting and, the, to a certain extent, the Trump visit to emphasize the independent direction of Philippines foreign policy that he has been emphasizing since he became president? In other words, will President Duterte see the ASEAN meeting as an opportunity to embellish his nationalist credentials or as an opportunity to reassert this, the importance of this U.S. Uh, this Philippines-U.S. Uh, alliance. Third, will President Duterte publicly acknowledge the U.S. role in assisting the armed forces of the Philippines during the Morali crisis? This seems like a small question, uh, but it has been made, made uh, larger by the extent of U.S. assistance and the limited attention given to that assistance. The United States provided special operations forces to advise and assist the AFP on scene throughout the Morali crisis. The U.S. also provided continuous intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance support, including manned and unmanned aircraft uh, over, for over five months. And utilized the, it allowed the Philippines to utilize the logistics agreement with the United States so that the Philippines armed forces could be continuously resupplied with expendables like munitions. In a conflict, this is extraordinarily important. $33 million in total, I think, is the amount that was allocated by the U.S. to support the armed forces of the Philippines during the Morali uh, event. But at the, uh, the ADMM Plus, the ASEAN Defense Minister's Ministerial or, ASEAN Defense Minister's meeting plus in, at Clark recently, President Duterte hailed the support that he received from China and Russia, which included uh, a small number of small arms and automatic weapons and some trucks, uh, show gifts, incident, one of the weapons I'm told, one of the, the rifles I'm told provided by China was being used in a demonstration by a uh, armed forces of the Philippines soldier, and I am told that that weapon exploded in the hands of the soldier. So sometimes show gifts don't work out the way 
uh, you want them to. But the US provided extraordinary support, and it has been minimized by, by the Philippine side. I would like to see uh, how President Duterte handles this opportunity to um, recognize the value of one aspect of the value of the relationship. Fourth, I'm curious to see how President Duterte and uh, the uh, other ASEAN members, ASEAN leaders, handle the South China Sea question. That has been discussed earlier by, by, uh, by others, but I think it's worthwhile uh, remembering that uh, it was the Philippines' uh, effort in the arbitral uh, event that brought to a head the attention to China's aggressive behaviors in the South China Sea. I'd like to see how ASEAN deals with this problem. Uh, it is indeed uh, um, commendable that ASEAN leaders are taking a problem-solving approach to the South China Sea. But let's see what happens this year when they are together. And lastly, if privately President Trump raises President Duterte's anti-drug campaign in their bilateral meeting. How will President Duterte respond to this? Uh, President Trump has said in the past that he is willing to raise controversial or contentious issues, but that he chooses to do it privately so as not to make uh, a public matter of it. But will, but, but leaders are sensitive. So I wonder, will this, um, probability or possibility that President Trump speaks to President Duterte about the anti-drug campaign have any effect on their personal relationship? And if so, how that will play out in our uh, efforts to become closer and more helpful to the Philippines. So those are the, the five things for each side that I'll be looking for, and uh, I, I hope that uh, as an analyst, I hope very much that there is a considerable uh, interplay here that allows me to assess it. Thank you. Thank you, John. And as you're preparing questions, uh, if you have a particular question uh, addressed to one of our speakers, please uh, note so on your card. Um, if you wish to ask a question to the panel, that is fine as well. Meredith Miller from Albright Stonebridge. Uh, thoughts on trade, investment, commercial opportunities. U.S., Philippines, U.S., ASEAN. Great. Well, um, thank you, Brian and Hank, for inviting me. Um, and thank you to the previous panel. I found that to be uh, terrifically informative. Um, I, I want to start out by saying that I think it's a wonderful uh, coincidence that the APEC meeting is being hosted this year uh, in Vietnam in the East Asia Summit in the Philippines um, at a time when uh, many countries, not only here in the United States, but many in the region are questioning the benefits of free and open trade and globalization to have those two very important summit meetings um, being hosted uh, in countries that have committed uh, to economic reform, to attracting more foreign direct investment, um, and are growing at very high rates, consistently above 6% uh, is um, symbolically powerful and I think very helpful at this juncture. Um, I will endeavor to keep my remarks brief so we have some time for discussion, but there's a tremendous amount of activity going on in the trade and economic arena uh, in the Asia Pacific, so forgive me in advance if I go a bit over. Um, I'd like to start out by kind of taking a step back to talk about the foundational and critical role that trade and economic cooperation have played in regionalism in Asia broadly. Um, for ASEAN, and we heard some of, about this previously, um, really, uh, in the early days, uh, talking about economic cooperation was a very important mechanism for building trust um, and deepening cooperation. Um, at that time, and even today, uh, talking about sensitive political issues, uh, such as the South China Sea or uh, the crisis in Rakhine State, um, could be challenging. And the 10 member states have very different political systems and different strategic outlooks. Um, and economic cooperation really provided the basis um, for ASEAN building the platform that it has today, which, um, as Patrick described, is now encompasses many important areas of cooperation. But it's still a foundational aspect. And I expect that when uh, the 50th anniversary celebration takes place, one of the key things that's going to be celebrated is the progress that's been made on economic integration, and particularly 
the ASEAN Economic Community. Um, APEC, of course, was explicitly founded to further economic and trade liberalization across the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, and it was the United States that elevated APEC to a leaders' meeting. And it was the United States and the Bush administration that championed the idea of a free trade area of the Asia-Pacific um, to raise the level of ambition. Um, since that idea was introduced, and actually even preceding it, there have been a number of multilateral platforms proposed uh, in the region for reaching that long-term vision of a fully integrated Asia-Pacific region. Um, for the United States, that was the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Um, and within ASEAN, ASEAN has been championing the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, which is ASEAN plus uh, 16 FTA partners, um, with the idea of integrating into a mega FTA. Um, I mentioned both of these things, one, because uh, clearly uh, economic multilateralism and integration is going to be a very important feature of discussions taking place uh, both in Vietnam and in the Philippines. Um, and also because the U.S. withdrawal from TPP um, and the recalibration of uh, U.S. trade policy has introduced an element of uncertainty uh, into these discussions, which I think is going to be very important um, uh, elements going on uh, both at the forefront and behind the scenes in the region. Um, the TPP, uh, many of the members, Japan, Australia, and Vietnam, and others, have uh, decided to pursue a TPP without the United States, so TPP 11. And right now, uh, the parties are meeting in Japan to discuss whether or not they can make an announcement uh, that they're going to move forward with that proposition uh, when they meet in Vietnam. Um, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, we also expect there will be a meeting in Manila um, and a renewed commitment from those members to carry forward that agreement. Um, clearly, the United States is not a party to either of those discussions. Um, but I think there is a, an element of uncertainty about how the United States, which historically has been a champion of that long-term vision for free trade area of the Asia-Pacific, is going to intersect with the broader discussions on trade and economic liberalization at APEC. Um, and we saw some of this come out uh, at the trade minister's meeting earlier this year. Um, bilaterally, I think many countries in the region are going to be looking to discuss um, with President Trump and with members of the administration how they can cooperate uh, with the United States on a bilateral basis. Um, there's been a big emphasis in the administration on addressing trade deficits. Um, there was an executive order earlier this year um, identifying uh, countries with which the U.S. had significant trade deficits and asking USTR to uh, study that and come up with suggestions on how to address that. Um, there are, uh, I believe, eight countries in the Asia Pacific that are on that list. Um, so those countries in particular are looking for ways to keep the relationship on a cooperative footing. Um, they're also looking for ways to keep the United States engaged in the region. So we've seen that part of the TPP 11 discussion and debate has been, uh, how do we keep this arrangement alive, and how do we keep it as something that the United States might potentially join uh, in the future? Um, countries in the region are also going to be watching very closely how the discussion in China goes on the bilateral economic trade issues. Um, ASEAN, of course, is very closely integrated in its supply chains through both China and Japan, and any disruption in that relationship would have broader ramifications on the region. Um, they're closely watching the renegotiation of NAFTA, uh, as to get a better sense of where the administration is going to take uh, its America First policy going forward, and of course, the review of the U.S.-Korea uh, bilateral trade agreement, um, which will likely be a feature of discussions um, during the president's stop there. Um, in the interest of time, because I know we're running short, I'll just say that there's also going to be some very important discussions taking place in the multilateral space and with the United States on infrastructure. So I think everyone here is probably well aware of China's One Belt, One Road initiative, a very ambitious infrastructure funding uh, uh, program, and that's something where China has recently said they would welcome U.S. engagement and dialogue. Uh, Japan uh, has a quality infrastructure investment uh, initiative, which I think now they've pledged around $200 billion over five years, and they've also suggested some multilateral discussions uh, to talk about how to best uh, take that forward, um, which would involve uh, the United States, India, and Australia. So a tremendous amount of activity 
and a tremendous amount of uncertainty, I think, in terms of how the U.S. intersects in the multilateral space uh, with the long-term vision of an integrated Asia-Pacific region. I'll stop there. Thank you, Meredith. Um, and uh, thank you for keeping your remarks brief so we can jump into our discussion. Um, and, and hopefully we'll have more questions for Meredith so she can continue to, to flesh out some of the, the details that, um, that might have you know, been lost in, in keeping your remarks brief. Um, I have a list of questions that I prepared, uh, but we only have about 10 minutes uh, for our Q&A discussion. So I'm going to jump right into your questions. Um, and uh, this is a, the first question is for Charge Chuasado. Uh, but I think it's also one that anyone um, would, would like to answer could could jump in on, and um, it it focuses on the the, the rhetoric and the, the new discourse of Indo-Pacific um, that the U.S. has taken up. Uh, how does the government of the Philippines view the new U.S. emphasis on the concept of the Indo-Pacific? Uh, the Chinese government has made critical comments in reaction to this term, viewing it as a sign of containment. Uh, is India becoming more important to the Philippines? Well, we, Philippine government has not, uh, you know, uh, had extensive um, discussions on the change of nomenclature. Uh, we were recently just informed of that. But uh, what I can say is that, you know, uh, as long as the U.S. remains engaged in uh, in Asia, with uh, ASEAN, you know, as a central core of its engagement, you know, we we will not be jealous about it. <laughs> That's uh, as I said, you know, as long as ASEAN is always at the center, ASEAN centrality is there. Sure. Um, you know, we will uh, will engage all of the partners. Uh, dialogue partners. India is a dialogue partner of ASEAN too. In fact, it's part of, uh, you know, of RCEP also. So we wouldn't, but, you know, as I said, the Philippine government has not yet uh, you know, done extensive uh, assessment on that. It's a new term. Mm -hmm. Richard, could, could you help shed light on this, this change in discourse um, in framing the Asia-Pacific as the Indo-Pacific and, and um, conceptually what is behind it? Well, I don't want to speak too much about it. Um, as the Philippines desk officer, you know, mostly my, my brief is the bilateral relationship. Sure. Um, but I will just say briefly that it, it shows the emphasis that the, the Trump administration is placing on the region uh, in terms of looking at in, in kind of a broader, uh, more holistic context, um, taking into account all the players and the new realities and trying to have a larger and more expansive vision. And I think that's reflected, you know, most clearly in the fact that, as Des Murphy said, President Trump is taking the longest trip to the Indo-Pacific region that any leader has taken since 1991. Uh, so I think that's a clear, uh, clear evidence of our commitment and our seriousness, and the fact that we're going to continue to engage with all our partners, both in ASEAN and kind of in the broader regional context as well. Thank you. Here's a question for Meredith. Um, what is the possibility of pushing forward a U.S.-ASEAN free trade agreement uh, apart from bilateral trade agreements? or anyone who would like to take this up? Um, I think that's a low probability at this point um, for a couple of reasons. Um, first, the Trump administration has expressed a preference for bilateral trade agreements. And I think to the extent that we do see any new uh, trade agreements, um, negotiations being launched, and um, I'm a little bit skeptical about whether or not we will, um, those would be bilateral in nature. Um, secondly, uh, historically, the U.S. and ASEAN uh, have not been able to launch FTA talks because of the disparity in terms of the levels of ambition. Um, ASEAN includes uh, some of the wealthiest countries in the world and some of the poorest, um, and the U.S. Uh, requires a very high level of commitment to trade and economic liberalization. Um, and for that reason, um, we have not been yet ready to undertake that path. Um, TPP was intended to provide a road forward uh, in that regard with this open accession clause. Um, but right now I, I see that as being, um, unfortunately, still something that uh, we have to collectively work towards in the future. Do you have any counterpoint? No. <laughs> um, and here's a question for Charge Chuasado and, and uh, Professor Wise. Um, 
how do you assess the difference between President Trump and President Obama in their Asia policy? Uh, President Trump announced uh, to walk away from the TPP. Um, how does U.S. engagement change in the Trump era? <laughs> sure, Bill. I was going to use a moment to think about that while you answered. But I think there, there are uh, significant differences uh, on, uh, between the two approaches, first. And second, there's a, it is an important point that, at least in other areas, President Trump has made a uh, full effort to separate himself from the legacy of President uh, Obama. So uh, on one hand, they are different. On another hand, President Trump is trying to uh, accent the difference. How are they different? Uh, President Obama was very committed to uh, US bilateral and multilateral presence in, in Asia. It was balancing bilateral and multilateral relationships that was the key to his administration. That was his sense of it. And it combined security and economic and political relationships, uh, the manifestation of which was the pivot to Asia. But the pieces of the pivot, the, the, the economic piece, TPP, the military piece in changing our uh, allocation of forces, and the political piece of meeting more frequently at a higher level is uniquely Obama. We do not have enough evidence now, I don't think, to reach a conclusion about President uh, Trump's approach to Asia. As said in my, my questions, I would like to see what that is, but I don't think that uh, uh, it is there now. Now, one person has suggested that, uh, I think by a question, that the very fact, oh, I'm sorry, perhaps it was Richard, but the very fact of a trip of this extent is significant. And uh, that is uh, undeniable. It's significant. Uh, I suspect the news is going to come out of Northeast Asia, not out of Southeast Asia. But as I also suggested, we, we don't know with these leaders. We, we don't know. So uh, in short, these are very different men with a very different approach to Asia we can surmise. But we need more evidence of what President Trump's approach is to reach a definitive conclusion. You know, it's not for me to uh, comment on uh, you know, the uh, personalities of two presidents. However, what I can say is that you know, what is important for ASEAN is that uh, you know, whoever the President of the United States is, he, is, uh, he shows commitment and, uh, and full engagement with ASEAN, as I mentioned. You know, um, ASEAN, as, ASEAN has made it a point to always, uh, you know, to engage the United States as a very, uh, very important dialogue partner, and we are, you know, gratified uh, at seeing, you know, evidence by, you know, by whoever the U.S. president is, that, uh, you know, he's looking at ASEAN. He or she is looking at ASEAN. In the case of President Obama, he has several trips. But in the case of President Trump, right now, I just wanted to, you know, to inform the group that you know, the very first um, group of ambassadors that Secretary Tillerson met when he assumed was the ASEAN ambassadors here in Washington, you know, way ahead of the other regional groups here. For us, uh, from, from, you know, from January, we already viewed this as an indication that uh, you know, the Trump administration also looks at ASEAN as an important partner. And the fact that he met, uh, you know, gave, uh, you know, we welcomed four you know, ASEAN heads of state and is going to, to Manila is already, you know, a testament to that. But of course, notwithstanding that, you know, there's still more to, to work on. Can I comment sure. on that, Brian? So, of course, there have been shifts in um, areas, including uh, the U.S. position on climate change. Um, some recalibration on human rights. Um, but as I said in my remarks earlier, I think the biggest change to date is on the trade front. Uh, so the United States has uh, for decades championed a free and open 
trading system, um, the WTO rules of the road, uh, the TPP as an effort to um, raise trading standards uh, and address 21st century issues in the Asia Pacific, um, and the U.S. withdrawal from TPP and withdrawal from those conversations has introduced a vacuum in the region. Um, I mentioned the APEC trade ministers meeting earlier this year where uh, for the first time that I'm aware of, there was a significant dispute over including language in the statement against protectionism because of objections from the United States. That, that is a dramatic change, um, and there is a recalibration in the region right now, uh, I think going forward, in terms of which countries are going to uh, take up the leadership mantle in this effort. And we've seen that already from Japan, um, we've seen that to a certain extent from China and others, um, but this is a situation that's still evolving. And speaking of filling that gap, I have questions here, a few on, on China increasing its influence on ASEAN. I think that's something for us to, to think about. Um, and uh, because we've run out of time, um, I'm going to take these remaining questions and give them to Professor Bill Wise to add into his analysis um, looking into the next few weeks. Um, and I want to thank uh, all of you for, for coming out. We do have a closing remarks uh, coming up, so please do not run off. Um, but and thank our panelists as well uh, for their time and their insight today. Thank you. And I'd like to invite uh, President of the U.S. Philippine Society, John Meister, uh, to come up and, and give us brief closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Can you hear me? Um, I think today, number one, we want a green light. A green light. Okay. Um, number one, to thank everybody who appeared today. Uh, you know who they are. Uh, we have had a very rich menu today of what goes into making both the U.S. Philippine Society and the Stimson Center so important in the city of Washington. U.S. Philippine Society is aimed at raising awareness of today's Philippines and the dynamic U.S.-Philippine relationship uh, of this contemporary time. And we have seen it with the presence of the diplomatic representation of the Philippines and the Foreign Service, Senior Foreign Service representation of the United <laughs> States, plus, let's not forget the desk officers who do much of the work, as well as the Philippine Embassy staff here. These are professionals, and they are showing the Washington community and anybody who's watching this the strength of <coughs> professional Foreign Service officers. So we have provided the platform to do that. Then we have the analysis side. Dr. Uh, Bill Wise here uh, threw out 10 questions in typical <laughs> Professor Bill Wise style to make us all think. Meredith, thank you for laying out the trade uh, realities and the economic realities because they are many. This is for all of us to contemplate. We have provided the opportunity to do that. And my thinking is this is kind of just the beginning. When the trip is all over, we ought to do it again and review and see what we've come up with. And you can be sure that the U.S. Philippine Society is going to be on that beat. So thank you very much for being with us today. And uh, we're all going to continue our work and be uh, maybe surprised, maybe not so surprised, uh, <coughs> Professor Wise. Uh, but uh, let's follow it closely. Thank you all for being here. <laughs>